terrified wandering mind The seams have come undone You've been telling lies to these eyes As if they'd never seen the sun Now you've let your guard down And your heart is exposed Now you've let your guard down How could you have known That I'm the big fish round You're a small fish I could make you disappear You should know this I'm the big fish round here You're a small fish I could make you disappear You should know this I'm the big fish All games you used to play, the rules were never clear. Smaller minds make easy prey when there's a cool song, right? Fear. But now you, you sung your heart out, <clears throat> and there's nothing left to say. Now you, you sung your heart out, you've given yourself a ring. I'm the big fish round here. You're a small fish. These are my buddies. They're in LA. They're great. And live, they're just ridiculous. I'm the big fish round here. You're a small fish. I can make you disappear. You should know this. I'm the big fish. All right, what's up? So <clears throat> that's like Kipia. For any of you guys who want to go check them out, guys, gals, pronouns indescribed. Uh, no, this is uh, Lycipia. And Lycipia is actually a place where my buddy, who was a soldier in the British military, Alex, was stationed uh, in Africa. Pretty intense story there. I won't steal his thunder, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the, like just all sorts of crazy stuff you can't even imagine guerrilla attacks and just all sorts of absolutely whimsical stuff but yeah okay let's see oh there we go we got a little little background okay so guess what we're not going to talk about today anything crypto we're not talking about crypto so if you want crypto advice if you want to hear about what to buy what to sell what should I do? Should I this? Should I that? Wrong. Go. Kick it. Go somewhere else. <laughs> There's plenty of videos out right now that'll tell everybody what to do. Plenty of places you can go to get all your advice. That is not this. We are going to talk about a really cool... Um, so, real quick, let me sidetrack. Public service safety announcement. Be careful. There is a fake... Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this. There's a fake Celsius app floating around that asks you to link up your MetaMask and add your private keys. You guys realize you never expose your private keys to anyone ever for any reason ever, right? That's you. You take it to your grave or you give it to whoever you want to take all of your stuff. That's what private keys are. Private keys are for you getting access to your stuff or exposing them to somebody it's going to steal all your stuff. That happened to somebody we know. Yeah, like Kippy is so great, dude. I, I challenge anybody to go listen to their music and tell me you don't love it. Big Fish is awesome, but it's like just the very starting point. They have, it's this really cool, epic, kind of, kind of EDM, but also kind of Caribbean. I don't even know how to explain it, but it's very epic, cool music. Anyway, that's like Kippy. Do them a solid and just go kind of check them out. Because if you like undiscovered, really cool bands that are well-funded, like Hippia. 
Okay. Um, so this this Celsius app thing will it will get you to it looks legit. Well done scam. And you will put in your keys and all your stuff will disappear. And the danger is if they get a hold of your MetaMask, guess what they also have control over? Well, if you use that MetaMask to sign all of these transactions for all for you know staking at all these places and you put your assets over there, you're gonna have to go through a bunch of work. Um yeah, think of your well, no, technically. Your private keys and your passphrase are different, but they can achieve the same thing. They both achieve the same aim, and that is to unlock a wallet and let you you sign transactions. Okay. Typically, a private key is going to be a long string of unintelligible gobbledygook numbers and letters and symbols and stuff, and mostly letters and numbers, upper and lower case. And then the passphrase is going to be a 12, uh, a 24, or whatever, uh, normal words, bear, car, pool, dog, Gorilla, you know, I think I used all animals, but yes, they, they have all these words and da da da. So, how much uh, APY will they get from fake MetaMask? Well, <laughs> and this one, look, I, I have hated on Celsius before. This isn't Celsius's fault. This is some very clever uh, engineer, designers, scammery guys, and they got someone in the community that we know who is. A pretty smart person usually and and they hit me up instantly they said "Uh oh and i said ah crap dude you made a mistake and they're like yeah i go you never and they're like i know luckily the damage was they only got i think like a, a quarter of an ethereum from him problem is and we have we we have the we know where the where it went what they did is when they emptied the when they emptied his uh, MetaMask, they did it at a time when Etherscan was off. For those of you that also don't know, and again, we're not going to go into, we're not talking crypto today, but I'm just going to remind everyone that yesterday, as part of the Berlin hard uh, Berlin transition for Ethereum, there was uh, a couple of the, <laughs> there was some issues. We'll just say that. I don't want to go into the whole thing, but there was some, there were some issues, a couple of uh, places that were supposed to be forwarding blocks were stuck on a certain block for like hours and so ether scan was not functioning correctly because it couldn't reconcile between all the um nodes that were reporting and whatever anyway no one seemed to care i guess it's priced in whatever um so yeah bad day for ethereum but not for the price so there you go uh news doesn't matter so anyway don't ever expose your private keys don't expose your password key phrases whatever you want to call it don't Ever. It doesn't matter how official it looks. You don't need to expose those things. Okay. Now, if you're transitioning from a wallet to another wallet, just do all of the due diligence that you can and go and and make sure that um like I never click a link. If I see a project, I'll just type it in, make sure I typed it correctly, look up, check the, you know, check the link in your in your browser, go look and see like, does that right? Did I type it right? Does it have like a weird extension on the end of it? Did I click the wrong thing? Don't click in text messages. Be very careful when you click in emails. It's just that this whole space is a a big, sweet honey pot for um, duplicitous people to come and steal all your stuff. And you don't want that. You guys don't want to make all of this currency units to give it all back. So, yeah. Okay. Um, we're not going to talk macro today. We are really going to talk psychology so I found this really cool article, and yes, I'm going to go and I'm going to acknowledge everyone because we never don't do that. We never don't not do that. Uh, oh my God. Great chat last night. Yeah, I got lambasted for it, so that won't be happening again. <laughs> I got more complaints than I've ever gotten. So apparently, uh, Jeffrey, it was you and I that liked the discussion, and that's it. <laughs> okay, um, so – It sucks. I don't want anyone to get stolen from. There's nothing, man, my worst experience, do this in the chat box. Everyone, tell me the earliest time in your life you remember something getting stolen and it having an effect on you. There is something, it it is freaking painful when something gets stolen from you. 
I had a bike stolen. It was totally my fault. I had this really cool blue uh, uh, GT. It was a GT Pro Freestyle Tour. I got it for Christmas. And it was like, I was I was into like kind of like biking with when you had the pegs on the front. My buddy had a ramp across the street until his, his dad like ate a 38 slug. Long story. But um, so we, everybody in the neighborhood, the cool thing was biking. And we would get our bikes and we'd pimp them all out with like pegs on the front, pegs on the back. The, you know, the handlebars that would, where they wired the brakes through the handlebars or they just took the brakes off the bike, period, so that you could spin the handlebars around and do all sorts of just pimp ass stuff. Anyway, that bike got stolen. That was the most expensive thing I ever owned as a kid, even after that. And it, it demonstrably changed my mindset forever. I was probably... 14 15 and uh it was gut-wrenching dude gut-wrenching and they both they went into our backyard they broke into our we had this um work like a work shed area where my dad had like tools and all kind of stuff like uh, uh like a wood shop type thing where he would build stuff because he built a lot of stuff he's a photographer so he would build a lot of sets rather than you know buying them he would just go build them in the back so we had this bag big thing anyway um I lost that bike. So they broke into the shed. They took the bike and I didn't know it for a day or two. Well, I, we knew it when we went out there cause they had kind of wrenched open the door and it was just gut wrenching, dude. It was just gut wrenching. And, uh, ugh. and it changed the way. So, I mean, you just feel like I'm completely powerless. So I felt like I didn't even want to own anything good for a long time. Oh, they cut the lock, Gordon. That sucks. First 10 speed. A lot of people, a lot of us have lost bikes. So I'm not alone on that. <laughs> oh, God. We have lost a lot of bikes, have we not? So anyway, it's <laughs> sixth grade, lost a girlfriend. I lost my first fight. Dang. But you can recover from a fight. You can go learn how to box. You can get another girl or get that girl back. Um. So I guess those are, you could maybe kind of fix those. Um, <laughs> I lost my buying power you, due to currency debasement. Yep. <laughs> we've all, we've all lost that. Um, remember that's different. We're not going to get into it, but that's currency debasement is not inflation. It can look a lot of, alike, but they're, they're different kind of mechanisms. Let's see. Uh, God, oh man. Wojtek got punched off my bike by an eight-year-old. I was 10. Dang. That sucks. You know what? You're, that's worse because you actually got assaulted. I would hunt that kid down to the end to the end of the earth. Remember in that the Bill Murray movie where he a shark like ate his hand or something? So he's like his whole mission was I'm going to find that shark and I'm going to kill it. That was like the whole thing of the whole movie. I'm going to find the shark that attacked me and I'm going to kill it. That was the whole – Light, uh, life aquatic, I think. Yeah. Anyway, that was kind of great. Okay. Let me say hello to everyone and then we'll get into the fun. So yeah. So if you're here for crypto stuff, um, wrong channel, not today. All right. Uh, Joe Fernandez. ¿Qué estás haciendo? I hope you haven't lost anything recently because losing sucks. We want to win. All right. Jimmy James, Brady, Todd Bishop. What up? Um, Scott, what's going on? Scott and Scott Hill. You guys are always like bang, bang. That's kind of cool. Uh, trying to decide if I keep selling options on Ledger X or put everything on Nexo. Um, bah, 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 you will do the math. Do the math. I guarantee you, you're banging way more than 5% on Ledger X. Just saying. Okay. Uh, Scorpion, what's going on? Dean, what up, Dean? Um, good to see you. Good to see you. And, uh, you know, Dean, I know we, we play, I think it's you. We playfully go back and forth on, uh, on Twitter all the time, but I, I, I'm, I'm giving you – I'm half giving you grief. I don't believe all NFTs are nonsense. I just think that the NFTs on the Cardano are nonsense. Space bubs, get the crap out of here, man. I'm going to go – the. I'm going to really try and do zero profanity today. You're going to see – you guys are going to see a new me. I did so many push-ups yesterday because of my little potty mouth. Oof. All right. Uh, Demayan, what's going on, buddy? Force and tanks, no token, of course. Yeah. There's counterparty. Yeah, I like the the way Nexo works 
once you get sucked up into it, you're, you're going to own that Nexo token and you're not getting rid of it because then you lose your rewards and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's kind of, it's a, it's an actual, it's a, it's a true utility token. I mean, it's, it may be the only true utility token. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Ella Paul, good to see you. Michael Murphy, across the pond. What's going on? JJ. Uh, let's see. Skeptical Poo, Hoop and Tony, what up? Ryan. Brandon, what's going on, Brandon? Jerry, what up? Uh, sorry, Jeffrey. Jerry, is Jerry in here yet? I wanted to get Jerry on the show today to talk about something that happened to him. You guys can probably put that together. Uh, Liquid Smoke. I like that name. It's cool. I wish I had a cool name. Uh, uh, Leon, what's up, Leon? Le I'm going to give Leon the award for asks the best questions in on live platforms. And doesn't let anyone interrupt him ever. Leon, you win. You need to be a politician, my friend. You would win every single debate because people would just be like, when he starts talking, just let him finish. You ain't cutting Leon off. <laughs> Period. Uh, Adam, what's up, Adam? Some good staking rewards. Uh, I do want to ask Adam. We're not going to talk about it today because we're not talking crypto, but it seems like the staking rewards have, have gone up by about 10% in Cardano, just net net. My last three, pop, pop, pop. Yeah, my last three pay. No, my last two payouts went way up, like demonstrably higher. All right. Oh, Fishing Magician. What's going on? Expat Matt. Here we go. I don't want to miss anyone. Pete Kelly. Jeffrey, of course. Yeah, we did. We had a lot of fun last night. Um, Tiffany, hello, 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 Garth. What's going on? Oh, you got a car at seventeen. That sucks. I had a car stolen, but it was recently, and we had badass insurance. I don't really care. I was like, okay, bye, bye. <laughs> uh, Ashley, Dave, good to see both of you. Um, let's see, JJ. I want to make sure I get everyone. I don't want to miss anyone. Plu, what up, Plu? We haven't seen you in a minute. And uh, I know that some of these, me going through the names bothers people. BZ, what up, BZ? And if and if that bothers you, it's probably the wrong place for you. Don't come here to get advice. I'm not giving any advice. I'm not, get close. I'm not giving advice. You do you. I'm just rambling for an hour, and hopefully it makes your day a little bit more bearable. Uh, let's see. I bet $10 on no profanity. Yes. Go, Leon is 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 long, no profanity. See, I've attached punishment. This is why this is how I discovered this article. I was looking at mindset, cognitive bias, and all sorts of things. My buddy Steve and I cuss way too much. We were working out yesterday and we were cussing and stuff. And I was like, "What's wrong with us, man?" I said, "Okay, that's it. We need a punishment. We need to in we need to enforce some kind of rule that's not ridiculous and overbearing, but but alerts us to our behavior. And we can make a, a course correction. So that's what we're doing." Um, let's see. Um, ba -da -da -da. I think I got everyone. Okay. We got it. Oh, Al, of course. Al Greco. What up, man? All right. Um, let me go over here. Cause we got a lot of new friends over on the, uh, Theta, which is awesome. Um, let me say hello to watch guy. Too many consonants. <laughs> Crypto patty. What's up? Uh, Scorpion shark, shark pay, pay, P P E I pay, pie, pal. Uh, stress relief. Gordon Bennett, Claire Smith, uh, the real J. Cole. Oh, good. The fake J. Cole was here. We didn't trust anything. But now that the real J. Cole is here, Engage. Uh, Biotech Breakout, SGO 30 TV, B. Relu. Uh, Sniper Princess, Ocean Dawn, Joe Pirate. What up, Joe? Um, but da da, JR80, CC Brown, Philippe. Um, what HK, Belinda, D. Duck. What up, D. Duck? Uh, Jow, uh, NBD, Frank, uh, Top TV. That's cool. I like that name, Top TV. Basic Instinct. Uh, Antonio, what up? Darting Uphill. <laughs> God, we all got crushed for bicycles. Um, okay, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, Darius, Darius Carr, good to see you. Welcome. Welcome to the fold. Uh, Mark. Mark. Tommy, we got a good group today, man. We've really been growing the theta, the theta peeps. Bill, Steve, hello, Sylvia. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Uh, get involved. 
uh one three ft one i three it's either i three one three one thirty fifth it's always a riddle is coin tracker the best to use to help with tracking and taxes i think it's great uh and beach girl spirella okay Whew. i think we did it and, and just in case i didn't get involved got it okay now we will run the little the little thingy and we will start the show and we're going to talk brain science. No crypto today. You guys know what's going on in the markets. You don't need me to tell you about it. You already know. Maybe it's logical. Maybe it's not. Doesn't matter. Price is always right. Right. Let me get that little banner off the screen. Let me get our comments back. Okay. We're not talking the cryptos today. That's right. Because you can be led astray. It's all fake news. It's phony stuff. It didn't happen. But do I have the other one? Fish. Way with words. Let me go over here. Somewhere, laughter, Simpsons, thing, some, some, ooh, yeah, the suspicious music. We like suspicious music, do we not? McNabb, what's up? Okay. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave the screen so you don't see me struggling at this article. So we're going to go here. Good. I wonder if I can find, let me find some other cool art. Let's see. It's too bad there's not a way. Oh, this one's cool. Since we're getting inside the brain. We're going to get inside the brain. Not just Mickey's brain, but the brain, the brain. Okay. So I found this interesting article. And it is... Well, let me just go through it. And I want you guys to sit back and relax. You don't need to study. You don't need to look at the screen. You don't even need to see what I'm doing. Um... Just kind of absorb. We, we used to talk a lot about cognitive bias. When the show first started, that was one of our main subjects was cognitive bias and behavior and thinking, whether it's rational, irrational, counterfactual thinking, flawed logic, things like that. And to be a good investor, I think these things are important. I think that lately, for a variety of reasons, um, there's, there's a lot less um, rational behavior in the markets in general. Ooh, cool. It got big. Sweet. I think that's, a, I think that's better. Is it, is it not better? Yes. So I think there's, there's some behavior in the markets that is good for the investor, for some investors, but I think it's going to be overall bad as far as net behavior. Um, so I want to just focus back. Let's, we're going to rewind back to over a year ago when we first started this thing, when it was me and Jerry and Jared and Steve. Um, Steve you guys remember Steve Wisniewski, uh, Hall of Famer uh, from the uh, Oakland Raiders. Um, and uh, let's see, we would have Dave on. We, uh, Brady was coming on. and It was the original group, and there were just a few of us. And we really focused more on the psychology than the actual trading. We didn't talk about coins as much. We just talked about the why. We really focused on the why. And I think that's been lost. And I think now we live in a world where we chase the green. And we don't have the, the psychological game in check. Now, do you, need to have, do you need to be an investor to be successful? Do you need to have an investor mentality? Not really. Um, you can go to the casino and you can win. And so, and I was, I was looking into the kind of the behavior in and around casinos. We were joking around the other day. I said, you know, you, 
you go into a casino and if in matter of fact Jeff and I were talking about this last night, you go into a casino, you throw some cash into a slot machine, it's the first time you've ever been in, you pull it, you win, all of a sudden gambling is easy. And you say, Well, that yeah, we, we know it's not. Well, th there are some <laughs> kind of chemical connections that, that start to be created. Neurons get it kind of redirected and, and some neural pathways start to form that are not um, – that, that, that create bias thinking, that create continued bias thinking. I said, well, how would that – how does that all play out? I, so I found this cool article. I was just bouncing around the last few days, and one of it – was and so what really spurred this um, was the incident that happened with our buddy when he gave his keys away. This is a guy who knows better. Um, we all know better. We know you don't give your private keys away and all this kind of stuff, but he got enticed into something because he was looking for, I think it was, they were saying free $500 to sign up. And this is a guy who has a lot of money. $500 is not enough to make you behave, you know, irrationally, but that lure of free, that lure of the gift. And, uh, yeah. It's frustrating. Um, yeah, JD, we did lose. We we lost so many great episodes, um, especially the Emil Emil and uh, Emil Kalinowski and Jeff Snyder. We had some awesome talks, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, they're they're coming back, by the way. So, um, as we go forward, I'm going to read this article, and then I'll do some sidebars on it. Um, and my original study was psychology and philosophy. Um. And my dad was a math guy and, you know, a physicist kind of dude. And then he got burnt out and he went into um, photography. Um, but he, you know, science background. And my, you know, many of you know um, my college roommate, best friend growing up. He uh, runs the, uh, the Whitehead Department of Stem Cell Research at MIT. So basically, this is like where most of the kind of bleeding edge stem cell research um, both, you know, uh, biology based and, uh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Point is smart dude. And his dad was a, uh, the, the Dean of research, the head Dean of research was a mathematics at SMU. So again, that's just like the environment I grew up in. So in, in all of, you know, math will take you so far and then you're still left with your brain. And so it's very important, the reasons why we make decisions and, and if we can derail flawed thinking. And we have to be very careful that what we don't do is is use reason and, and quasi-logic to justify behavior that we know probably isn't justifiable. So anyway, discussion. The purpose of this study was to examine the effects – let me turn this down a little bit – was to examine the effects of belief in good luck – and of upward counterfactual thinking on gambling behavior among college students. First, results indicate that groups with higher levels of belief in good luck wager more money when gambling than groups with low levels of belief in good luck. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? If I think I'm lucky, <laughs> I'm going to up the ante. This suggests that perceiving luck as an internal trait is a factor that leads to wager more money when gambling. This confirms the result of other studies where a higher belief in good luck led to increased confidence in risk-taking. And this behavior pushed towards uncertain situations. So uh, if you want to look this up, Dark and Friedman, 19, uh, 1997. Uh, also, uh, Wool, Young, and Hart did a research study in 2005. So <clears throat> again, this confirms the result of other studies where a higher belief in good luck led to increased confidence and risk-taking behaviors towards uncertain situations. Those thinking they were lucky tend to wager more money. Um, and, you, and you know where this can go, right? Okay. Yes, you can't see what I'm reading, Plu, because I don't want you to look at what I'm reading. I want you to just kind of absorb, right? You don't need – if I'm reading it to you, you don't need to read it. Just absorb it. I'll, I'll make sure I get you guys links if you want to look at this study. It's pretty cool. In this study, there were no difference between the groups with and without upward counterfactual thinking. This seems consistent with results from other studies, whether it's Hayes, Brownstein, Zettel, Rosefarb, 
going all the way back to 1988, 1986. They've been studying this kind of the, the kind of underpinnings of, of gambling mentality and things like this for quite a while. Um, let's see. No, I'm not tying this into anything because this is not that. Um, this is all of our behavior in one big pile. And we just need to make sure that we're always making um, non-cognitively biased decisions, especially as investors. If you're trading and you're trading off metrics and numbers, then the rules probably change a little bit. But still, you want to have good biased, uh, non-biased thinking. Anyway, okay. The results from other studies confirm the claim that betting behavior is related to cognitive fa factors rather than to the results of the gambling. In other words, it can be said that if belief in good luck may have a relatively more – it may have a more powerful effect on betting behavior than upward counterfactual thinking. These results can also be explained by the fact that upward counterfactual thinking took place in a manner which maximized regret after gambling behavior, not in a way that maximal, maximized benefits after weighing the gains and losses. Um, let's do a little sidebar. I'm going to do a little sidebar. Let's talk real quick. Do you guys – have you guys ever read about maximal, maximizers and satisficers? So two people – Basically, th these are in these are opposite sides of a spectrum. You have maximizers and satisficers, and we are all somewhere on one end or the other, or somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. <laughs> <Crypto keys. laughs> oh, they're so stupid, dude. God. Okay, so what is a maximizer? So you go to the store, you look at some shoes, and you start going, wow, this one costs this much, this one costs this much, this one costs this much. You start analyzing and analyzing and analyzing. You, you overanalyze. Analysis paralysis. Why? Because as a maximizer, the stress you get from a bad decision, from a, ba uh, a bad buying decision, is much higher, much, much more disproportionate to the – you stress or utility you get from a good decision. So let's just keep it in terms of points. A good decision is a plus one. A bad decision is a minus one. A maximizer, when they buy something and they start to have buyer's remorse, instead of it being a plus one for a good decision and a minus one for a bad decision, it's a, it's a plus one for a good decision and like a minus 17 for a bad decision. They punish themselves for what they perceive as a bad decision where they either didn't properly analyze the information or they rushed to a decision or a variety of factors. So that's maximize, right? You're trying to maximize your utility and you typically have buyer's remorse, right? It's almost like you're never satisfied. I fall closer to that. Then you have satisficers on the other side. They look at three pairs of shoes. They pick the one in the middle and they say, eh, I'll take it. Um, because they just want to be satisfied. Satisficers tend to live much more rewarding lives, but also tend to make poorer financial decisions. And, but again, these are just averages. You can be a satisficer and also make great financial decisions. You can be a maximizer and lose all your money. But on the aggregate, maximizers tend to overanalyze and will defer decision-making due to tyranny of choice, analysis, paralysis, and a variety of other factors. Satisficers will rush in when they've reached a threshold for decision-making that's good enough, good enough to satisfy me. That's fine. I'll do it. They tend not to, well, it's the opposite of maximizing, right? They underanalyze situations and they tend to be more susceptible to trend following and things like that. Okay, great. You can read, there's, probably more pages than war and peace in the research of maximizers versus satisficers. But as a background for what we're going to talk about, there you go. Okay. Let's go back in. We'll put see, uh, let's, let's put some cool suspicious music back on and we'll dig back into the article. Okay. Okay. So let me, let me go back to that paragraph. Okay. The results can also be explained by the fact that upward counterfactual thinking took place in a manner which maximized regret after gambling behavior, not in a way that maximized benefits after weighing losses and gains. Right? This is an indi uh, that is the individual does not engage in casual reasoning because he or she does not want to regret what could have been won if less money had been bet, <clears throat> and the individual could not <clears throat> could have 
one less money if less money had been bet and the individual had not lowered the betting amount. So basically what it means is it's the way you you are making your your speculative decisions, right? So the individual does not engage in casual reasoning because he or she does not want to regret what could have been won or lost. So think about the satisficer. They don't go into the long thought process of looking at all the details and the math and the numbers and the statistical variances and all this kind of stuff. They don't want to do the research because the other side of that is then they realize on the way out, uh uh-oh, I made a mistake and I did that research. That turns back on them as as kind of as being self-destructive or essentially eroding their faith in their own decision-making process. Does that make sense? So um, uh, there is a state called uh, the state being caught in a trap to explain a phenomenon that results from a similar psychological mechanism as those discussed above. So when people keep buying the same combination of lottery numbers once they have bought a certain combination, right? And they they lock themselves into this trap of poor decision making and less and less analysis, uh, because if you were to do the analysis and find out what you're doing is flawed, then you have to admit to yourself that I'm making flawed decisions, and that that creates kind of um, uh, it, it erodes your your self confidence and 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 under it undermines decision making. Okay, in addition to individuals not wanting to feel regretful, the chasing behavior could have affected the results in this study. Chasing refers to the behavior where after repeated losses, people tend to increase, (laughs) here we go, people tend to increase the amounts bet in order to make up for those losses. Okay, I'm down here, so I'm gonna go big here. I'm due. If I just keep doubling the money, I'm gonna get it back. And when there is no money, you go look for extra money. Where do you get that extra money? Well, that, that starts to get into the question of leverage. You got to be careful there. I know the whole leverage thing, you know, everybody's kind of split on that. Um, so, you know, if you're going to be involved in leverage, be a maximizer, right? You'd rather be over analytical than, than under analytical. A satisficer should not use leverage because you, you'll, they'll get punished and they won't understand why they got punished because they won't really understand their, you know, the level of risk they were taking. Whereas a maximizer, you might overanalyze the situation, but you're probably not going to miss something, and you'll pro- you will likely have a a better chance of that leveraged situation being successful. Again, these are averages. This chasing is a well-known factor that results in several negative gambling problems. If you've ever found yourself, oh, I'm going to double down on this one. I'm due. I'm going to go big, throwing good money after bad, like a, a, th- a something that you like. It goes down, so you pour more money into it, but you don't realize that the information is materially changed, or at least you're not you're not open to the idea that the base case might have changed. You're going to start falling victim to these things. And the thing is, psychological problems that result. This kind of gambling is built into humans. It is built in, you know, to to our kind of intellectual DNA. It and and the the lines that are drawn are 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 chemical. These are biological. These are, these are physiological things. It's not like I choose to gamble. I choose not to. These aren't choices. They are um, patterns of behavior that get enforced and reinforced and, and, you know, by, by continued behavior, right? So the second result of this study is related to the expected winning rates. And it indicates that groups with an upward counterfactual thinking expect fewer wins than those without it. An interaction between the belief in good luck and upward counterfactual thinking were also found. This indicates that there was no difference between the expected winning rates in groups with low levels of belief in good luck, despite the presence of upward counterfactual thinking. However, among groups with high levels of belief in good luck, those with upward counterfactual thinking had a dramatic decrease in their expected winning rates. So during the participation, so this is all, this is all with college students. And I can go back to the original – I may go back. The reason they used college students is because they were looking at when people engage in gambling. And it is in the mid-teens, you know, kind of systemically if you look – you know, Korea is a big gambling country. Um, I think like 85% of people in Korea gamble, like gamble, not like, hey, I'll bet you five bucks. No, like 
gamble as, as a part of society, as a part of their behavior, normal, trained, conditioned, consistent behavior. Um, and you say, well, not in America. Well, it's over 70% in America, and these numbers are pre-crypto. And I think if you look at just the behavior over the last three, let's say four years, 2017 until now, you can see patterns of profligate gambling behavior starting to show their heads. I mean, you don't have to look any further than GameStop, right? Um, and, you know, certain other things that are more relevant, more like today. All right. Um, during their participation, so this, so they studied college students, okay? <clears throat> so when you say their, their participation, they're referring to college students, uh, I believe, no older than 22, no younger than 18. All right. During their participation, people with low levels of belief in good luck thought luck was a, a coincidental, unstable factor, which a maximizer would agree with. A maximizer would say, yes, luck is not a strategy. You can't have a belief system that relies on luck. You have to reduce all of this stuff to math. You have to be careful when you're doing that not to quantify behavior uh, that, is, that is not math-based and, and try to – and just make sure that you're not overvaluing or overweighting psychological phenomenon and, and ignoring kind of contradictory information – and, and, and rationalizing that off or, or trying to justify it in your model. So again, I would say an investor should, should endeavor to be more a maximizer, more a study of detail, a study of numbers, trying to reduce the noise as much as possible so you can make a good conscientious investment decision. All right. So let me return back. During the participation, people with low levels of belief in good luck thought that luck was a coincidental, unstable factor and largely considered the, this the contingency in the results of gambling. As a result, when given a question to predict the winning rate, assuming that they would perform the same game, they made a realistic judgment based on their experiences of gambling, regardless of the upward anticipated counterfactual thinking. On the other hand, people with high levels of belief in good luck thought that their luck and behavior affected their chances of gambling. Now, when I say this, you guys all go, well, yeah, obviously, right? You know, I go into the casino, I pull the thing, I win, gambling is easy. We know that gambling is not easy. We know that it always reduces to math. It's, again, when you start to believe that you have some control over the outcome or you take some data and you skew it to kind of fit your scenario, that's not what you want to do. You don't want to fit your, your thesis. You want your thesis – to reflect as much rigor as it can on the actual numbers and the math in the perceived future, right? And so, again, it's it's again, I say reduce yourself, be more of a maximizer, even if you're not in life in investment. Try to be more of a maximizer, right? More data is better than less data. And I know everybody's like, yeah, there's analysis paralysis. Fine, I understand that. And at some point you have to make a decision or not, but you want to make a decision or not with all of the data at your hand, uh, it, right in front of you. You don't want to just go, ah, I'll, I'll leverage. And this is where it gets to leveraging. This is why I say, do not listen to what I tell you. If, if I have a thing that I like, or I don't like, that's who cares? It doesn't matter what I like or don't like. It, it doesn't matter what anybody likes or doesn't like. You have to decide what you like what you don't like, what, you're, what kind of um, success or punishment you're willing to endure along that path with these investments. Um, because the whole space, as we know, this space that we have chosen is illiquidity and illiquidity and illiquidity and some very scrupulous behavior among some individuals um, that have a lot of, a lot of units of – of various assets and they're playing a different game than we are. And so just be very careful. Okay. So, um, on the other hand, people with high levels of belief in good luck, thought, uh, in good luck thought that their luck and behavior affected their chances of gambling <clears throat> led to a decrease in the expected winning rates through upward counterfactual thinking. That is a contrast effect occurred in that the higher expectation of winnings coming from luck magnified the reality of the failure, which in turn caused negative effects and evaluations. 
because the truth creeps in, doesn't it? At some point at 3 a.m. when someone shakes you, you know that you can't forcibly win the lottery unless you're one of those guys that was doing the McDonald's thing where they were sending out the, the little winning coupons to like all their buddies. And, and, and sidebar, it's a really cool show. Go look at the, the study. I think it was a Netflix where they looked at the people that rigged the McDonald's lottery thing, you know, the, the monopoly McDonald's monopoly thing. And they, the FBI was like, one of the guys, at the FBI said, you know, hold on. This is kind of funny. One of the guys at the FBI said, isn't it weird that everybody that won the McDonald's thing like lives within like 50 or a hundred square miles. Doesn't anybody think that's weird? And they were all like, Oh yeah, maybe that's weird. Yeah. Maybe that's weird. So, and it started this investigation and all this kind of stuff. It was pretty crazy. And it turned out there was this crime, like this, this gangster dude that had kind of set this whole thing up and he's blackmailing people and threatening people and all this. And then you're going to win, but you're going to give me the money and all this kind of stuff. Crazy. Anyway, that was the McDonald's thing. If you guys want to check it out. Okay, let's go. Let's continue. So there are many studies that examine the directions of anticipated counterfactual thinking related to emotions. And here's where, here's where the tricky part comes in. When you're looking at markets, any market, you, you have to factor in emotion, but you don't want to succumb to it. You want to reduce all of the emotion out of these kind of decisions, but you definitely have to factor in other people's emotion because emotion moves markets, right? And emotion and chaos and let, for instance, fear of missing out. One might buy something because it's going up because they think everybody's getting rich around me and I'm not, I'm not participating. I'm not getting rich. Quit caring. I know that sounds silly. Let me go. Let me go here. Quit caring. I, this is my advice. Quit caring if other people are, are, are catching this green candle and that green candle and they're winning here and they're winning there. None of that stuff really matters because you're not competing with anyone else. It's not like at the end of the year, if you haven't paced Bill or Bob or Susie, that someone's going to come take all your stuff and boot you out of your house or apartment or van down by the river. That's, that's kind of flawed thinking in and of itself. You're competing against yourself. Don't worry about the markets, percentages, the average, the aggregate. You have to make decisions on a consistent basis for yourself. By the way, hello, Vincent. Hello, Nesh. Good to see both of you. Candace, good to see you. King, good to see you. Um, you. You have to make decisions. You have to have, in my opinion, you don't have to do anything. I, I, you should endeavor to create a way in which you feel you understand the market and make decisions, investment decisions based on that. Understand that trading and investing are different. Understand that what you might do over a two week or a three week or a six week period might be a different decision making process. Still with all of that analysis, still with that fundamental analysis, still with all that maximizing behavior, because you want the information, right? But that's a different mindset, technical analysis, trading the numbers, the Fibonacci retracements. That's a different, and again, it works for some people, doesn't work for others, but that's a different system than investing based on value. And you can do whatever you want to do, and no one can tell you what's right for you. I certainly can't. No one can. But you have to figure out what works for you. And I would urge you to be consistent with that. And if you're going to experiment, so if you're typically a value investor and you, do, and you follow your kind of framework and you've been successful, why would you, why would you transition away from that and, and go and start gambling? You don't need to. You know, do, does any does anybody here need all the money? Does anybody here need everything, all of it, or is it just okay to make progress, continued progress? Because I'll tell you right now, I have a number in my mind that I want to reach. Oh, I'll tell you what the number is. It's fifteen million bucks. I want to have. I want to be liquid for fifteen million. I believe that because I don't have any kind of addictions, I don't drink, I don't you know. My grandma, she's different, but me, I don't really have any of those vices 
that would burn money up. So for me, 15 million bucks, I'm good forever. I'm good. Now, would I like to have more than that? Of course, we'd like to have hundreds of millions of billions. But if I reach that goal, that is my current goal, I will feel like finally I have reached financial escape velocity. Everybody needs to, I think, you should figure out what that number is. It's going to be different for you. Don't discuss it with anybody other than maybe your financial planner. Um, and this isn't about having an, an ejection point. And what I mean by that, uh, many of you know that Jim Cramer sold half of his BTC position yesterday to pay off his mortgage. If you know anything about Jim Cramer, first of all, the Jim Cramer that you see now is not the Jim Cramer that there was before. Um, Jim Cramer is a smart guy. I would say borderline brilliant, a much, much better trader in every way, shape, and form than like Novogratz. But Jim Cramer, late to the party. Jim Cramer got muzzled after the whole thing with Tim Geithner. You can go look into that. I'm not going to rehash all that. But it was basically he got put – they put the muzzle on him. Now, before all that, you read – he has a really cool book. This talks about when he ran a fund and when he converted to doing the newsletter and all this kind of stuff. And Jim had some problems with the, the, the drink and some other things. And a lot of people try to get an edge and they end up – you know, addiction – Addiction takes many forms, but Jim Cramer is a very intelligent, astute investor. He's not the clown you see, or at least he wasn't the clown that you see. Bye, bye, bye. Sells up that guy. That guy is not Jim Cramer. Okay, that guy is a puppet, a silly, cute little dumb meme puppet goofball that makes a lot of money on CNBC. Okay, when Les, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And Patrick, good to see you. And ba -da -da -ba -da. Surf Tech, good to see you. Okay, cool. I got all the new ones. All right. So, and Jim Cramer did not exit in a bad way. When Jim Cramer left managing money, he, he had many currency units. Somewhere, he was over 100 million. His net worth is somewhere, they say, around 150 to 200 million. That's not bad, right? It's pretty good. Jim Cramer. Bing. Bye, bye, bye. Okay. He invested in the twelve to seventeen thousand dollar range. He invested in the corn, in the Bitcoin. He sold half of his position yesterday to pay off his house. And if you know anything about Jim Cramer and you know about the kind of money he has, I'm guessing that was not an insignificant sum. I'm guessing he paid off a huge mansion, castle-y type of a mortgage. People are like, oh, how dare you? You're like the pizza guy. You're like, he's like, pizza guy. He's like, I bought Bitcoin at 12,000 bucks. I cashed out at 62,000. I paid off my mortgage. And he still maintains half of his position. So he didn't exit, but he did something that a lot of people took him to task for. He made a meaningful change in his current financial life and in his future. As he says it, he says, I took the phony money and I turned it into real money. Um, that's right, Fortress. So I mean, are we Kramer haters because he cashed out a little bit and he paid off his house? He might have paid off $30 million. Who knows? This guy, he might live in a cloud city. He might live in a citadel. He might be looking down on us with laser attack things, targets right now. I don't know. Maybe not. But Jim Kramer is not poor, broke, and I'm guessing his mortgage was a big deal. He paid it off. Crypto, for the rest of eternity, at least Jim Kramer's eternity, Changed his life, demonstrably changed his life. When you get these events, gifts from the universe <laughs> that demonstrably change your life, you might want to take advantage of that. Don't be fatalistic. Don't be absolutist. I'll never do this. I'll never do that. I will do this. I will do that. There are certain assets right now that I won't right now buy. But if the story fundamentally changed, then I would buy them. There's certain assets I own right now that I no longer feel comfortable with. Over this weekend, I told you guys yesterday I was going to start trimming down. Over this weekend, I am taking my entire portfolio and I'm slashing it by one-third, meaning 60-ish percent will remain. 
and about 30 to 35% of those assets, I'm out. My name's Bennett. I ain't in it. That list on Monday is going to look a lot different than that list looks right now. Um, for me, and I'm not telling anyone to do anything. I'm not telling anyone to exit. I'm not telling anyone to buy. I'm not telling you to do anything other than create a, a way, a framework for your thinking. This is where I share, even though I'm not a big Rao Powell fan, um, he's an intelligent dude. I think he's a little kind of smarmy, and I think he's a Johnny come lately, but he's not an idiot. And if you want to kind of listen to how a portfolio creation and frame and, and, and like base case for thinking and frameworks, Rao is a he's a legit dude. He's one of those dudes where if I was at a party, I'd be like, Rao, I hate you. Oh, but I respect you. Um, unlike Justin Sun, who I both hate and disrespect, but would love to party with because the dude's probably so much fun, even though he's a total shill scammer. Okay. I said shill. Don't anybody be like, oh, ha ha, shill, S-H-I-L-L. I didn't say the, the other word. Okay. Let's go back to the article. But anyway, there, that was just a little side note on Jim Cramer. So yes, Jim Cramer sold half his position. He paid off his house. And everybody's giving him guff for it. How dare you, Jim? You sold. Oh, shut up. Paid off his house, dude. He probably he probably cashed out. And he still kept half of his position. It's not like he's exiting crypto. He just made a meaningful change to his life because he, he must have estimated that we've gone too far too fast. And I could – I don't agree with him as far as Bitcoin. But I do agree with him on a lot of other assets. Okay, let's go back. Mickey, you know what? Let me get you guys another piece of art. Let's go. No. No, no, no. We already got that one. Oh, that was average price, average sale, less. Oh, same. okay. Let me. Ooh, let's go to. Ooh, this one's kind of cool. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this one. Here, well, we'll leave you with this one for now. Bam, bam. Yeah, this is cool. This is a – we have to collect the whole set. Alex and I are collecting the whole set. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Jim got weak hands. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I don't I don't ever think – I don't. I think the whole weak hand, strong hand, that, I think that whole thing is silly. Um, I think you do what's best for you. You make a meaningful change in your life, and you go, you go with it. Um, I've never been a – I've never subscribed to that whole kind of – we can strong hand thing. I, I think it's, uh, I think that's flawed. Um, a little bit flawed thinking. Hold on. Let me do one thing there. Okay, cool. Oh no. There. All right, man, this freaking zoom keeps trying to open, which is silly. All right. There are many studies. The, the, there are many studies that examine, let me make sure I've got this right. Yes. Okay, good. You can see what I can see. My God. Buttons. One day I'm going to get good at computer. It's not today. There are many studies that examine the directions of anticipated counterfactual thinking related to emotions, but inconsistent results have been found in follow-up studies. Believing that the directions were not the only factor for which anticipated counterfactual thinking affected emotions proposed a reflection. So the Markman and uh, McMullen are, uh, study in 2003 proposed a reflection and evaluation model called RIM. According to this model, given the upward counterfactual thinking occurs, if the content is reflective, <clears throat> it is accompanied with the positive emotions, and negative emotions occur when the content of upward counterfactual thinking is evaluative. Now, this sounds like gobbledygook for most of you, so I will try to – let me try to dig through this. For instance, assuming that upward counterfactual thinking occurs, an individual would think that if I had studied harder, I would have received a better grade, which – isn't necessarily true. What if you studied sufficiently and you have some impediment, some learning impediment, and this information doesn't resonate with you? It doesn't necessarily track that simply studying harder would have equaled a better grade. What does studying harder mean, right? If the individual reflectively accepts his thought, focusing on the possibility that A could have been attained, he or she would feel positive emotions. On the contrary, if the, indi if the individual feels that the, the thought is evaluative, paying close attention to an evaluation towards the fact that A was not received, he or she could feel negative emotions. 
and th- th- a lot of this is kind of the way that this information was put to them. And then the in through these gambling studies, the way they looked at future outcomes. So a lot of it is kind of this forward thinking, the, the forward thinking model that gamblers use. Um, and, and again, the, the, the more on the satisficer side, the less efficient you're going to be, but you're going to be quicker at pulling the trigger. The more on the maximizer side, the slower you're going to be to make a decision, the more you're going to have this tyranny of choice, right? Presented with tons of choices where you, you get frustrated with the decision-making process or you have, which can lead to analysis paralysis where there's so many inputs and so many stimulus and you, it, your ability to weigh that information effectively starts to break down, right? This is why AI will eventually win because we'll be able to, to program much smarter models that start, you know, these kind of neural nets off and they will be able to come in and go, mm, we need to downregulate this. We need to weight this up. We need to rebalance so, but, in, but we're probably still a few years away. So once we get there, I think that's going to be pretty impressive. In Sophia, we trust. All right. So anyway, this new testing model illustrates that for a, for a contrast effect to occur, it's crucial to consider how to perceive the content of upward anticipated counterfactual thinking. It's like it sounds. Counterfactual thinking is thinking or rethinking old information in a way that goes against facts in order to rationalize future decision-making or to justify past decision-making, right? I did this in the past, but it's because of this. Well, if the this is not a good answer, you just tweak the information a little bit, and all of a sudden you can rationalize what might not be rational decision-making, right? So, okay, Um, the results of this study has implications in terms of providing a precaution against gambling addiction. First, it was suggested that perceiving luck as an internal trait could affect the gambling, which is one of the cognitive errors, obviously, (laughs) right? Um, When it comes to prevention, correcting the cognitive errors of gamblers is important. If they don't understand that what they're doing is statistically flawed, if we don't understand that what we're doing is statistically flawed, then we're making a mistake. And the more we double down, the more we add to that. And, And hopefully, you know, if you have success as a gambler, the problem is you start to find ways to justify gambling behavior as, as sound thought, and that usually ends up bad, right? How many of those – how many gambling movies do you see where the guy comes out on top, he has no addiction, everything's fine? They almost always end with that little tag at the end where they've either lost it again, they're in a new gambling thing, they're like just compulsive gamblers. It was a great one with Mark Wahlberg, which is like super depressing, um, which just shows – you know, the, the, the danger of compulsive gambling and, and just how kind of wrecking it can be to your life. So when it comes to um, gambling prevention, correcting the cognitive errors of gamblers is incredibly important. As a result, when targeting those with high levels of belief in good luck, it's necessary to develop a process to rectify cognitive errors of the result of gambling and the overestimations towards winning, right? Oh, I think this is going to here. I think this is going to there. How many of you guys got text yesterday about a certain asset going to a certain completely ridiculous, you know, is it going to a hundred? Is it going to a thousand? Is it the next X, Y, Z coin? Most of you, I'm guessing. And even those of you that are bullish at a certain point went, ah, I don't know about that. Right? So, and you know, if grandma asks you where she should invest her money, you have a little gut check, don't you? If your dad or your mom or someone very close to you that can't afford to lose asks you what to do with their money, should I do this? Should I buy this? Should I hold this? You're not so cavalier, are you, about telling people what to own? It's not so easy. Um, anyway, keep that in mind. Okay, second, <clears throat> the study found that upward counterfactual thinking may be a means of severing the link between dangerous gambling behaviors, including chasing and unreasonable betting. Gambling requires immediate decision making, right? Which, what does that do? That, that starts to defer more towards satisficers. Gambling requires immediate decision making, which increases risks due to impulse, right? Because you don't have all the data. You haven't analyzed properly or at least sufficiently to make a decision. Also, there are few chances in gambling to make up for losses. Losing in gambling is like losing on a racetrack. If you lose time 
on a race car track. You're not going to make up that time because there's only a maximum speed you can go, right? All you can do is finish the race off the best way possible and, and get them in the next race. You're not going to make it back up on the track because there are limits. There are limits as far as, you know, the, <laughs> what a car can do physically, how much traction you can put down, how much, you know, gas and horsepower and all of these things that meet, uh, you know, at the, at the level of the track, you're not going to make up lost time, right? So there are a few chances in gambling to make up for losses with causal reasoning. If people have repeatedly worked through the operations that help them realize that gambling is not an internal factor, such uh, that it involves skill or effort, the risk of gambling addiction would seem to decrease, right? So when people understand math, they gamble less, right? And I would say to, to, um, to an extent, you know, when you understand, when you, when you can fundamentally analyze the assets in your portfolio, it's, no, it's not gambling, is it? At least it's not the same kind of gambling. You're not gambling as much. And the line between gambling and speculation, it's incredibly blurry. And you can win and be wrong. You can win and be flawed. And you can lose and be, and be correct. But one thing you can never argue is you can never, never argue the price. Price is always right. You may not agree with it. You may not like it, but it is what it is. But that goes both ways, doesn't it? Because when the, you can't say this is legitimate, this is the price, and then it drops 75% in an hour and a half, and then that's also the price. That's also correct. So be very careful. When the lunatics run the asylum, the rules start to change. So be very careful that you're not sucked into an echo chamber. You want to be in a place where – you're asking questions, you're being challenged on a regular basis, and you're questioning your own belief system. If you quit questioning your belief system, um, I think that's a road to peril. Uh, anyway, some implications for the future uh, for future studies. I really love these gambling studies because they're really intense. And, and this, by the way, this is the this is just the abstract of it, not the deep guts. This is just a discussion. Um, if you go deep into the guts of this study, it's really interesting. But it you you have to look up some words. It gets kind of it gets kind of <laughs> verbose. Okay, some implications for future studies and limitations of the current study should be mentioned. First, this study focused only on addressing upwardly counterfactual thinking. Right. Therefore, future studies assessing not only upwardly but also downwardly are needed to build up better findings of the effects of counterfactual thinking on gambling behavior. Second. Uh, and this and a way to think about counterfactual thinking is simply rewriting the future or past to fit your thesis rather than rewriting your thesis to fit the future and the past. Does that make sense? So instead of rationalizing your behavior and and trying to justify it, go the other direction. Try to tear down your behavior and look for flaws in it so that you can improve your your system for decision making. Okay. Um, second, it was observed that about virtual money. Uh, and, and, and this isn't cryptocurrency. This is virtual money in the sense of uh, this study. They weren't using real money. And so there is a sense that maybe these results are a little bit skewed because if people were behaving, they would behave differently if there was real money on the line rather than virtual or assumed kind of monopoly money. And I agree with that. When there's real money on the line, people behave a lot differently, right? So – it was about virtual money, and participants were all non uh, were all non problem gamblers. This study was done with eighteen to twenty two year old college students that didn't have gambling addiction. My guess is, if they were dealing with gambling addicts, this study would have looked a whole lot crazier. And we'll get into that. I'm going to find some of these studies, and maybe next week we'll go through some of the ones where we're talking about compulsion, and it gets really greasy. Thus, future studies should also consider pathological gamblers to examine whether or not belief in good luck is a risk factor leading to that pathological behavior, right? Um, like, like for instance, could you die? Could you go, could you regress them all the way back to the point where luck became something in their life that they thought they had more of than say the person next to them? Um, you know, luck is like, I say a lot, luck is not a trading strategy. <laughs> you can't say I'm going to get lucky all year. You might, but you can't plan on that. So it's a contributing factor, a belief in luck. You know, each one of you, look in the mirror. Do you believe there's good luck and bad luck? Do you have a lucky pair of shoes, a penny, a this, a that, a talisman, something you rub, a rabbit's foot? 
Can you imagine how awful that is if we were actually carrying real rabbit's feet around? Dear God. But anyway, if you believe in luck to any extent, then you have the propensity to go down the path of gambling addiction because it's a human trait. We all have the propensity for this. And again, you can reduce it. Maximizers, satisficers. So, and then this is just the way I look at it. You guys might find this different. Finally, the effects of upward counterfactual thinking on emotions, motivations, cognition, or on a perceived sense of control were not measured. Future studies should address those issues in order to investigate the effects of other factors on gambling behavior along with this upward counterfactual or kind of justification thing. So um, there you go. Kind of a fun study. I thought it was really interesting. I get into this stuff because I think it's cool. I'm, I'm always curious how the brain works um, because we are in this space, especially, but in all markets, if we're honest with ourselves This is a greater fool market. Um, The only way we make money is by finding someone to buy these assets from us. I bought it for X. I'm going to sell it for X plus Y. Y is my profit. It's double entendre. Why is my profit? Why? The deeper question. So you, you should probably just look, you know, Take some time and think about where you fall on the spectrum. We all fall in different places, but figure out where you fall on the spectrum and decide the way you form your decisions, your base case analysis. I would go listen to a little bit of Rao Pal. I know it's crazy. Go listen to him. They do a lot of good stuff over there at Real Vision, even though I, I don't like a lot of it, but I like more than I don't like. Um, and Rao is worth listening to. Um, Again, even though I don't like the guy, but he's worth listening to. He's, he's a smart guy. So I think it's important for all of you, take a few days, some of you with some big wins. I mean, pretty much everybody got some wins this week in the whole space. Take, go out, have dinner, have a great day, do boot camp over the next few days or, you know, whatever. But take some time to maybe reevaluate, go back through your portfolio and take a look and say, these assets that I own right now, would I, right now this second, would I buy these assets? And if the answer is no, you sell them right now. I don't know what else to tell you. If you wouldn't buy it, why do you own it? And if you wouldn't buy as much of it, sell down to a position where you would. That's the way rebalancing works. Brady, Brady had some really cool tweets about that. Brady is profound. For those of you guys that don't follow Brady on Twitter, follow Brady on Twitter. He is profound. Sometimes I get gummed up in his words, but but Brady is profound. We'll leave it at that. Okay, have a great weekend. Uh, Don't do anything. You know where this is going. (laughs) You all know it's time for grandma. Don't do anything my poor insolvent, drunk, strung out on meth grandma wouldn't do. And... Uh, you know what? You're not going to believe this. She was sober this morning. Yeah, she ran out of lewds.
We talking condos and nice clothes and dropping Lambos. I remember the night colds. We couldn't stand those. Try to drive on them high roads, but had to stay low. Now there's solutions to hard bills we couldn't pay for. I talked to profit to get some profit. We couldn't change the top. If it's a stock and I need a cop it, I wait for him to drop it. Ain't no option, let's get it popping. We chilling in the trap. I need some crypto playing in my pocket. By any means, I rock. This is the profit with Nick Black. It's time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain. We here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks? This where you get that. So go and grab you a nice chair. It's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, you talking to the profit? Hey, hey, you talking to the profit?